Well, good morning, Calvary. It's so good to be with you. I've actually been um, coming here almost every year. I think every year for the last 12 years. So this really feels like home away from home for myself and my family. We always look forward to being with you. A big thank you to Pastor Bob for the invitation and the opportunity to share this morning. Also, it feels like coming home because 46 years, nine days ago, I was born in Highland Hospital, uh, not too far from here. And so this is kind of home for me. Uh, lived in Fairport for the first uh, four years of my life. And then my dad left two high paying jobs and a beautiful home to follow Jesus and moved us all down to Springfield, Missouri, uh, where my dad and my mom went to Bible college and seminary. And so the beginning of my experience in school was in Springfield, Missouri, and it was 1983. I was four years old, about to turn five, and I was headed off to kindergarten. And I remember actually my first day of kindergarten. And what I remember the most about it is that the entire day I had to use the bathroom but I didn't know if I was allowed to. Like the whole day I had to pee and I didn't know what was allowed. I didn't know where the bathrooms were. I didn't know when I was allowed to go. I, didn't, I wasn't even sure who to ask. I was kind of a shy kid. And so the whole day I'm just suffering in silence, like just needing to use the bathroom desperately, but afraid to bring it up. At the end of the day, they line us all up and they say, all right, we're going down to the gym and we're gonna take pictures for the yearbook. And so we're standing in line waiting for uh, our pictures to be taken and the suffering is just increasing and increasing and I am dying and so it's finally my time and I sit down to get my picture taken and literally right as he takes my picture, I peed my pants. Now, this is actual evidence. This is, a, this is my kindergarten picture. So what you're seeing there is a combination of two emotions. <laughs> One is relief, <laughs> great relief from my previous suffering. And the other one is shame, deep shame as I enter a new form of suffering. <laughs> in a moment, in just a, actually it took a few moments, but in a few moments, I went from one type of suffering to another type of suffering. Sometimes that's how life feels. We're just going from one kind of suffering to another kind of suffering from the suffering of feeling alone and lonely to the suffering of feeling stuck in a relationship between two broken people, from the suffering of feeling like no one listens to you to the suffering of feeling like uh, you're being misunderstood by those who do, from the suffering of mysterious physical pain to the suffering of a devastating diagnosis, in one moment from one kind of suffering to another kind of suffering. You guys have been in this great series on the Holy Spirit, and Pastor Bob asked me to speak on the topic of how the Holy Spirit helps us in our suffering. How the Holy Spirit helps us in our suffering. I want us to look at a passage together in John chapter 14. John is one of the four gospel accounts that we have of the life and work of Jesus Christ. And in this passage, Jesus, I just wanna paint a picture for you. Jesus has most of his closest friends around him, and Jesus knows that he's about to leave them, He's, he's, he's just on the edge of entering into his passion, his suffering, his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. Jesus knows that everything is about to be turned upside down. He knows that he's about to leave them, and he knows that every single person that he's talking to is going to experience eventually significant suffering. And he says this to them in John chapter 14, beginning in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth, which is a name for the Holy Spirit. The world cannot expect, accept the Holy Spirit because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And on that day... You will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me, and the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So how does the Holy Spirit help us in our suffering? And in this passage, I think we see three gifts that the Spirit gives us when we suffer. And the first gift is the gift of his presence the gift of his presence. 
When I was growing up as a kid, I know this wasn't everybody's experience, but my parents were involved in my life and they were at everything. They were present at every important moment of my life when I was a kid. When I would play my Little League baseball games, they were always there on the sidelines cheering me on. Uh, when I was playing the trumpet and they were going to my elementary concerts. And by the way, now as a dad who has a daughter who plays the trumpet and I've gone to her concert, I know what sort of sacrifice of love that was, uh, what they endured. Um, when I came home from school with my pants wet, <laughs> they were there for me. They were always there for me. And then as I got older, the bigger moments, they were there for me. When I graduated from high school, uh, when I got married, when I graduated just down the street from Northeastern Seminary, uh, when my three daughters, my oldest daughter, Lilia, 16 years old, is with me this morning. When our three daughters were born, they were there. They were there. They were always present. Every big memory, they were there. And seven years ago, I lost my dad to a battle with pancreatic cancer. And six months ago yesterday, I lost my mom. And they're not here anymore. And people often ask me, what do you miss the most about your dad and your mom? You know, is it your, do you miss your dad's preaching? I do, I do. Do you miss your mom's singing? I, I do. She had a beautiful voice and ALS took her voice way before it took her life. So I didn't hear her sing for, for quite a while. Um, do you miss your dad's advice? I really do, I do. Do you miss your mom's cooking? Of course, of course. I mean, look at me, I'm, I'm wasting away. I'm <laughs> <laughs> but what I miss most is their presence. Like just, just being in the same room with them. That's what I miss the most. And Jesus knows that his disciples are gonna miss him. They love him. I mean, they've given their lives for him. He knows that they're going to miss him. And when he leaves, what are they going to miss about him most? I mean, his miracles, sure. His healings, yes. His teachings, of course. But that's not what they're going to miss most. What they're going to miss most when Jesus leaves them is his presence. So he doesn't tell them in this passage, I will not leave you uninformed, or I will not leave you without the resources you need to do what I did, or I will not leave you without the good memories of the times that we had. What he says is, I will not leave you as orphans. The presence. And the Holy Spirit is that presence to us, even in and especially in our suffering. See, the, suff the only type of suffering that you and I could never, would never survive is the suffering of being separated from the presence of God, a God who sustains us and strengthens us and keeps us in ways that we know and in so many more ways that we do not know. But the gospel, which is the good news of the person and work of Jesus Christ, at the center of the gospel is the cross. And on the cross, Jesus experienced that unfathomable suffering for us so that you and I never would. So Jesus went through the only suffering that you and I could not survive so that we could have his presence through ours. He entered into it so that we could have a way through it. It's important to say, because you won't always hear this in every stream of Christianity, that Jesus did not suffer so that we would not. Jesus in John 14 is talking to a room full of men who are almost every single one of them is gonna die for their faith in Jesus and suffer great things. Jesus did not suffer so that we would not. He suffered, listen, he suffered so that our suffering would not be without meaning and that it would not be without end. Meaning and end. There's no way around suffering. I don't probably have to convince you of that. You've lived enough life. There's no way around suffering, but because of Jesus, there's a way through suffering. And that way is marked by his presence. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he's with me. The gift of his presence. You might be thinking, yeah, but actually, I don't really sense his presence very much, or I haven't sensed his presence recently. I want to share with you three reasons before we get to the second point. Three reasons why maybe you don't sense his presence or you haven't sensed his presence recently. And these are not all that there are, but these are three of them. And the first one I'm gonna call a self-inflicted funk. <laughs> a self, a wound that you have done to yourself. In life, I have learned that I am often my own worst enemy. No one has lied to me more than I have lied to myself. And this is often true in our spiritual life. Sometimes I don't sense God's presence because there's something not right in my heart. There's something not right in my life. 
There's something out of order. I'm not positioned well to experience what God has for me. Now, this is not the only reason, but this can be one of the reasons. And so what do we do if we're in a self-inflicted funk where we're just not sensing the presence of God? I think we have to begin to see uh, the spiritual disciplines, like gathering like we are this morning and reading our scriptures and spending time in prayer. We need to see them not as obligations and duties and things that we do to earn or prove something, but we have to see them as means of grace. They're means of grace, which means they are gifts that the Father has given us so that we might experience more of Jesus' life in our own lives. When I grew up being a pastor's kid, I always thought that reading my Bible and spending some time in prayer was my daily effort to remind God of my goodness. God, I hope you're paying attention. I mean, I'm in Leviticus today, God. Like, <laughs> you don't even enjoy reading this. I hope you're paying attention. I prayed for someone that I don't like. Hope you noticed, God. Me daily reminding God of my own goodness. And now, you know what I've learned spiritual disciplines are? They're me reminding myself of his goodness. We need to look at prayer differently. I always envision prayer as me sitting down for coffee with God and we get done talking and we get up and we walk away and I always thought he's the one who walks away changed <laughs> by the encounter. I took my agenda, I took my list, I took my preferences, I laid it out before him, I changed his mind on a bunch of things, we shake hands and walk away, he's changed, I'm the same. We laugh, but we pray that way. What if the only person that's supposed to be changed when we get up from prayer is us? See, we, yeah, we pray to see change, but we mostly pray to be changed. If you're in self-inflicted funk, look at the way that you're approaching your spiritual disciplines. No one drifts towards Jesus. It does take effort and diligence, and Dallas Willard says it well. The grace of God is not opposed to your efforts. The grace of God is opposed to earning. It's one thing to do things to earn. It's another thing to do things because it's obedience. Let's not call obedience legalism because maybe it has been that way for others. Self-inflicted funk. The second reason you might not be sensing the presence of God the way you have in the past is what I'm going to call a God-ordained season. A God-ordained season. In Matthew 4, we read that it was the Spirit of God that led Jesus into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit led the Son of God into a wilderness. A wilderness. There are seasons, right? We're in, the mid we're in the change of a season right now. Look around. It's fall. Fall is my favorite. Who else loves fall? Fall is my favorite season. I love fall. I love the changing colors. I love football. Uh, I text Pastor Jonathan last night. I said, I'm nervous about tomorrow. I think he was probably surprised by that because I don't get nervous a lot. He said, why? And I said, well, because, you know, the Bills haven't lost yet. <laughs> and I listen to Pastor Bob every week on my podcast, so I know he usually starts by referencing some sort of prayer for the Bills. Um, <laughs> They have not lost yet. They're going to Baltimore tonight. Ugh. And I said, if they lose, Pastor Bob next Sunday is going to pin it on me. I'm a Bills fan, so it's not my fault, right? It's not my fault. I've done my part. I'm praying for them too. I love football. I love the flavors of fall. Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. I love the temperatures of fall. I love the clothes of fall. I love hoodies. I call hoodies the great equalizer because when you're wearing a hoodie, you, no one can really tell how in shape you are or you're not. So it's like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to leave behind the flimsy t-shirts of the summer <laughs> where there's no mystery and, uh, and throw on an XXL hoodie. But just like there are seasons in this world, there are seasons in the kingdom of God. Here's four really quick things I've learned about seasons in my life. Number one, every season is just a season. That's going to help some of you at some point. Every season is just a season. Number two, every season prepares us for the next one. Number three, every season requires something different of us. In the summer, we mow. In the fall, we rake. In the winter, we shovel, right? Every season requires something different of us. And number four, and this is most important, the same faithful God is sovereign over every season of your life. Spring, summer, fall, even if you're in the winter season, God is sovereignly at work. So trust the seasons. You might just be in a season, but it's just a season. Third reason you might not be sensing his presence is what I'm going to call a religious motivated rut. So self-inflicted funk, you're just not serving God faithfully or embracing the spiritual disciplines as means of grace. Uh, God ordained season or number three, it's a religious motivated rut. Here's what I'm saying. You've become kind of bored with God and his stuff. 
You're very formulaic in how you approach God. You know the game. You know what to do. You show up on Sunday. You park. You grab your donut. You grab your coffee. You come in. You sing a couple of songs. If you feel moved, you raise your hand. You listen to the preaching. You laugh at the jokes. And then you go home and you turn on the bills, right? It's like this religious sort of like thing that we do over and over. But it's not changing us and we're not experiencing the presence of God. Well, here's my advice to you. Do something different in worship. So if you are a singer, maybe sit one out. Maybe just sit and listen one Sunday. If you're not a singer, maybe sing. If you're expressive, maybe just reflect one Sunday morning. If you're reflective, maybe just see how this feels <laughs> one Sunday morning. My point is, do something different. Like step out of what might be sort of a rut and see how the Lord might meet you in your stretching. Learn from a different voice. Listen to other voices. And there's seasons of my life where the most helpful voices in my life were preachers from denominations that I'm not even close to being a part of. And yet the Lord used their voice in powerful ways in my life. Try out a new discipline. You know, there are other spiritual disciplines besides giving and praying, reading the Bible and going to church. There's also solitude. And there's silence. And there's my least favorite one, fasting. There's fasting where you stop eating so that you can focus yourself on prayer. Another thing you can do is just do something that costs you something. Give, serve. In those moments, what we may find is the gift of his presence. So the first thing the Holy Spirit gives us when we suffer is the gift of his presence. The second thing is the gift of his perspective. And I think the Holy Spirit wants to give us perspective on two things. Number one, he wants to give us perspective on what is certain. There are things we believe to be certain that are not certain. And there are things that we're not sure about that are certain. And the Spirit wants us to help know what is certain. In verse 20, Jesus said, On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and that you are in me, and I am in you. It sounds kind of Dr. Seussy, but basically what Jesus is saying, on that day, you're going to see the beauty of the intimacy that is available to you because of the intimacy between me and my Father. But the first three words are so important. On that day, which meant not today. You're not going to see it today, but on that day, you're going to see it. When I was uh, in college, I did a two-month internship down in New York City at New York School of Urban Ministry in Queens. And every um, Monday, they gave us the day off. No, no classes, no ministry. And we would do the same thing. We'd get up, we'd get on the train, we'd go right into Manhattan. And we'd walk all over Manhattan, we'd explore the city. Now, um, I wasn't a foodie then. I'm a foodie now, right? I love the word foodie because it's like a nice way of saying uh, overeater. But I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a foodie now, but I wasn't a foodie then. This is pre-Food Network. This is pre-Bobby uh, Flay Throwdown. This is, this is pre-Top Chef. This is pre-websites uh, that you can Yelp. And, and, right? I didn't have that. And so I didn't appreciate what was at my fingertips, in New York City. And so while like I'm in the East Village and right around the corner from me is probably the best cheeseburger in the country, I'm working on a Big Mac in McDonald's. <laughs> and there's amazing pizza in Little Italy right in that area. I'm over, you know, following Michael Scott's advice. I'm in Sabaros, like enjoying a legitimate slice of New York City pizza. And if I could go back in time, I would say to myself, you idiot, look at all the good food around you and you're eating all this garbage. Tim Keller says this. He says that if we look back at who we were 10 years ago, we will always say something like, you idiot. How little you knew about your own heart. How little you knew about life. How little you knew how much you needed to still learn 10 years ago. Think about it, 10 years ago. And here's what that means. It means that your 10 years in the future self is going to look back at who you are today and go, you idiot. <laughs> there are things we can't give to ourselves or see for ourselves. And the Holy Spirit wants to give us the gift of perspective so that we can see what is certain and what is true. What happens in suffering often is we lose sight of what is actually certain and we hold on to what is not. And we begin to build narratives and identities around things that are not true. We have to protect ourselves and the Holy Spirit helps us with that. But the other thing the Holy Spirit wants to give us perspective on is not just what is certain, but what is what is useful? What is useful? You know, when you read the Old Testament, it's just like the highlight reel of these people's lives. Exodus 2, Moses uh, kills an Egyptian and runs for his life. Exodus 3, the burning bush encounter, encounter. And we're like, wow, God does things quick, really fast, right? No. 40 years. 
40 years between when Moses leaves Egypt and when God speaks to him in the wilderness. And it must have felt at times to Moses like a total waste of his life, a total waste of his time, 40 years of just being in the wilderness, learning how to lead sheep and how to survive in a desert. How would that ever be useful for the kingdom of God? And then what does God call Moses to do? To lead sheep, known as the Israelites, and to help them survive in the desert for 40 years. In the kingdom of God, even in our suffering, it is not wasted. Nothing is wasted. Here's what I've learned in my life. Often what I'm trying to escape, the circumstances and situations that I'm trying to escape or numb myself to, God is actually trying to use those to shape my heart, to grow me, to make me more like Jesus. We must learn to endure instead of escape. And when we suffer, if you've been like me and you're suffering in your grief, when we're suffering, when we're really suffering, We struggle to serve God the same way. We really do. Our emotional margin is gone. We're just not who we normally are. So when I suffer, I struggle to serve God with the same intensity and the same frequency, the same passion, the same diligence, the same eloquence. It's just not within me. And here's what we assume. We assume that our service to God in our seasons of struggles is not useful or not as useful, but we're wrong. In 2017, February 2017, my father, as I mentioned, passed, and uh, one of my daughters was six years old at the time. She was going to a small Christian elementary school outside of Syracuse, where we live, and uh, he passed in February. And at the end of that school year, so May or June, uh, her teacher sent me a picture. She said, I thought you'd want to see this. She said, we keep prayer journals in our classroom. And we asked the kid to write their prayer request in their prayer journal. And she said, um, I want you to see this picture of your daughter's prayer journal. And I, I brought it for you to see. And what she had written in her prayer journal was my mom's name over and over and over. Grandmama, grandmama, grandmama. And I, um, I posted this picture on my Instagram account. And, and this is part of the caption that I wrote. I said, if you think your prayers have to be more impressive, eloquent, or, eloquent or powerful than this, you are wrong. The Father knows what we need before we ask. The Son even now is praying for you, and His Spirit prays through you in your wordlessness or in your simplest of words, even when it's just one word written down over and over and over. He hears, and He's near. The Spirit wants to remind you this morning that what you think is, see, the enemy would like to say, you're useless in this season because you're suffering. But what seems to be useless from our perspective and the kingdom's perspective in God's hand, it's so useful. And I know that that prayer sustained my mom through that season. And I believe that prayer was as powerful as any prayer that any strong, faith-filled person prayed over my mom as she was grieving the loss of my dad. Don't believe the lie that when you're suffering, your efforts lose their usefulness. The Holy Spirit wants to give you that gift of perspective. And then last, I'm going to ask the band to join me. The gift of promise. In this passage, in verse 16, Jesus says something really interesting. It's easy to miss. He says, the Father will send you another advocate. That word another is important. It's not in John 16, but it's here in John 14. The Father will send you another advocate. What's the implication? There is a first advocate. If you're getting another advocate, there already was an advocate. What are we learning here? Well, the first advocate is Jesus, and the second advocate is the Holy Spirit. He's going to send us another advocate. And what's the Holy Spirit do? See, Jesus, as our first advocate, here's what Jesus does, our great high priest. He speaks to the Father. Even this morning, he's praying for you. He's praying that you get this. He's praying that this shapes you. He's praying that this grows you. He's praying that this truth sustains you in your season. Right now, Jesus, the Son of God, is seated at the right-hand side of the Father, and he's praying for you. So as our first advocate, advocate is a word that means someone who speaks for us or on our behalf, Jesus, the first advocate, speaks to the Father for your good. But the second advocate, the Holy Spirit, is a little different. Jesus speaks to the Father for your good, but here's what the Holy Spirit does. He speaks to you for your good. And you know what the primary message of the second advocate is? There's a first advocate. The Holy Spirit loves 
to reveal Jesus to our hearts. In fact, the primary work of the Holy Spirit on planet Earth today is not to make us speak in tongues, not to give us spiritual gifts. Those are all different things and wonderful things, but the primary work of the Holy Spirit today is to reveal the person and work of Jesus Christ to our hearts. And then to reveal that Jesus life within us. That's really what the Spirit is doing. The first advocate, he's saying, look at him. There's a first advocate. And there's two promises. The first one I've already mentioned, nothing is wasted. Trust God with your suffering. Trust God with your brokenness. Trust God with your tears. Trust God with your frustration. Trust God with your unanswered prayers. Trust God because nothing is wasted. He's redemptive. He can do it. Listen, when I was in, when I was in New York City, um, uh, doing my internship, I needed a haircut and I didn't know where to go because in New York City, it was just like the places I used to go weren't there. So I walked into this random barber shop and I sit down in there and no one in the place really speaks any English. And, and I'm not, and normally when you go to get your haircut, they ask you a couple questions like, hey, what kind of haircut do you want? Right? Um, uh, not this place. You just sit down. Normally, they kind of just go, they kind of use scissors and clippers and go back and forth. Not this place. This guy had scissors in both his hands. He's an ambidextrous barber. He's like Edward Scissor's hands was cutting my hair. And from the second he started to the second he was done, he never stopped. I couldn't barely breathe. I'm like, I'm going to die. I'm going to lose an ear. He's going to get an artery. Like I was terrified. But then once he was done, I looked in the mirror. It was the best haircut I've ever had in my life. And I realized just because I didn't know what he was doing didn't mean he didn't know what he was doing. Just because I don't always know what God is doing doesn't mean that he doesn't know what he's doing. Nothing is wasted. And the last promise is this, and we'll finish. All things will be made new. Jesus, in this passage, is pointing us to a greater day, to a greater promise. He goes on to say in other parts of John 14, uh, my peace I leave for you. It's not a peace like the world gives. There's something better. Everything will be made new. So even in your worst suffering, even when all seems lost, we have this promise. All will be made new. C.S. Lewis's last book of the Chronicles of Narnia, The Last Battle, he says it this way. He's speaking of the end of time. And he says this, And as Aslan, the lion, spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, but the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. This is a reference to the end of times. And for us, this was the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that we all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever and ever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Friends, this life, which seems so forever, but it's so temporary, is just the title and the cover page, but when we step into glory, it's chapter one, and it's a story where every chapter will be better than the one before. Jesus says two chapters later, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. There's no way around suffering, but there's a way through. Jesus says, take heart, I have overcome the world. When one of my daughters turned six, um, we let her choose what she wanted for breakfast, it was a school day. And she said, I want chocolate chip pancakes and bacon. I was like, that's my daughter. That's my daughter. <laughs> chocolate chip pancakes and bacon. And then we said, do you want to open your presents now or after school? And she was six. So of course she said now. And so we began to bring the gifts out. And one at a time, she would take the gift and she would hold it in front of her. And before she opened it, she would look at me and my wife, Erin, and she would say, whatever it is, thanks. Whatever it is, thanks. How do we face tomorrow with all of its unknowns? How do we get through a year where suffering will find us? If we have the certainty of his presence, if he gives us his perspective, and if we hold on to the promise that holds on to us, then no matter what's coming tomorrow, here's what we can say in the morning. Whatever it is, thanks. Whatever is coming this year, whatever it is, thanks. Whatever's coming in your future, and for those who you love, whatever it is, thanks. And that's how the Holy Spirit helps us in our suffering. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that your spirit is present even now to minister to our hearts. 
Make us a people who are quick to respond, willing to change, and grateful recipients of your good grace. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.